Okay, so you were born in Wilmington, North Carolina. At what age did you move away from Wilmington? I was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, and we moved to... We, uh, <laughs> not that Technology. We uh, moved to uh, Charlotte when I was one and to Florence when I was two. So I really call Florence my own. So you, you really did grow up in the in in PD. South Carolina, yes, ma'am. PD. Um, so tell us a little bit about your parents. They're both deceased now, but do tell us a little bit about both of them. Uh, both my parents. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, at growing up, I. It's easier now to reflect back at what my parents meant to me that I did not realize as I was actually growing up. Uh, I don't think I had a fond appreciation for not getting what I wanted, uh, which I think uh, many people do. Uh, I, but I now realize I always had everything I needed, which is, is a, a very, very big difference. Uh, my father was uh, in sales by trade. I think he always wanted to work with his hands. He was a wonderful wood craftsman. Uh, but could never find um, a full-time job in that. And so he did everything from coffee sales, he did liquor sales, uh, all kinds of very interesting jobs, uh, but never found the right fit for him. And so he was always changing and on the move, which I think my mother, being in a very stable profession education, really didn't quite always understand uh, why there was this movement. And I remember many a times my father sitting at the dining room table with a typewriter. Anybody can tell you what a typewriter is? <laughs> Uh, and typing out his resume and updating his resume and doing all those things to uh, try to make himself more marketable. Uh, and very interesting, in his uh, retirement, he ended up managing a liquor store, was probably the happiest human being on the planet, even though I'd seen him drink five times in my entire life. Uh, but it's those kind of ideas or places where he could just sit and chat with individuals that he seemed to, to really uh, relish. My mother, on the other hand, was very driven, very accomplished educator, had uh, been teaching since the day I can remember. What was her field? She started in elementary school, then went to adult education and landed in U.S. history, was uh, her forte, so to speak, uh, in which she taught for uh, most of the time that I can remember, um, and did all kinds of advising from the yearbook uh, to the uh, service club interact, which is uh, similar to mm -hmm. the Rotary Group, uh, and did all kinds of uh, extracurricular activities to help young people through. Sounds like a really interesting family dynamic going on there. And you were not an only child. You had a sister? I have an older <laughs> sister. Uh, she's three years older than I am, and uh, we now get along really, really well. We did not uh, at the time. Um, she and I shared one bathroom, which was not a pleasant experience at all. Uh, because she uh, needed lots of bathroom time and I could barely squeeze mine in. And so uh, we fall all the way through to the point uh, when I was a freshman in high school, she was a senior at the same high school, and we began to really uh, coexist better then. And then she went off to college and became really uh, the neatest person I've ever known. Uh, once she's out of the house. Yes. So, it was great. I, everybody out here who has a brother or sister can probably relate to that. I have a younger sister. and. We talk like cats and dogs coming up, but boy, she's my best friend now. All right, so um, tell me a little bit about your your schooling. You had your mom for a teacher at least once. What was your fav What were your favorite classes? It's very interesting, and and I kind of. Uh have thought a lot of becoming an educator myself and reflected on that, and I kind of need to start back a little bit further before okay. that. I was the, the person who could not wait to start school. Having a sister that was three years older, you know, I saw her go to kindergarten and first grade, and I was the one who was just pushing, chomping at the bit to, to get to go to school. And on the first day, I had my lunch box packed, it was a little metal one, uh, ready to go. Uh, got to elementary school and had uh, just the worst experience ever. Uh, I found that I did not learn at the rate of others, and uh, back in the 1970s, <laughs> um, we didn't have as many uh, safeguards in place or many programs that I think we do now. Uh, and so basically in my first grade classroom, well, starting in kindergarten, uh, everybody was learning their colors, and as you did, your caterpillar on the wall grew and grew and grew, and my caterpillar was really, really tiny, uh, just because I did not have the memory skills, and I couldn't tell you this was green or this was yellow. And, I didn't understand why I got to first grade and there were Miss um, Van Witzenberg, whom I adore, and to this day I, I've seen her since, still adore. It was the teaching, me teaching methodology at the time. You had two groups, you had the red birds and the blue birds. And she always started with the red birds and they just read and sat in circle and read and we worked on something else and then she would go, 
And now, now it's time for my next group. And we would come and we just struggled. We could not read. I couldn't do my, my times tables. I remember the biggest fight my mother and I had at that time with doing flashcards. And I just couldn't memorize them. And I had to do a test of, I had to do 100 problems in five minutes to get my certificate. And everybody got their certificate by second grade. It took me uh, to get my certificate. And so schooling to wrap all that up was very, very difficult for me and not a pleasure. And it only got worse when I got to middle school and the hormones started in and that all went downhill from there. Uh, being very awkward, I grew very quickly and uh, there was bullying involved. And so I think all of that coupled with the fact that I got to high school, sort of found my own, but even had a, a German teacher. German was the, the subject I, I chose to study. Uh, who literally came up to my mother and said, you know, uh, my mom was like, uh, how's he doing in class? And she was like, Betty, you just need to understand, he's a C student, he'll always just be average. You need to accept that. Well, if you know me, and I'm the spitting image of my mother, she did the whole, mm -hmm, and that was all she wrote. And uh, I, I ended up doing, uh, graduating um, with honors, but it was always a struggle. And I say that to say, I think that's why I can identify at times with those individuals who struggle with school, when schooling doesn't come Easy. My sister always seemed to have the easy road. The intelligence was, was natural to her, uh, whereas for me, it, it isn't something that, that uh, I do really well. My friends still laugh at me when it's time for me to do the tip, and I'm like, 10% of this, and they're like, we'll just give you the money if you'll hurry up. And so it's just kind of one of those uh, things that still to this day, there, there are pieces of it that uh, I still miss along the way. And, and being the, the son of an educator and having an older sister who was excelling, just exacerbated it a little bit, didn't it? It did. Well, it was, uh, you know, you follow in footsteps. And I think at that time, uh, nobody knew, uh, you know, I was tested. I wasn't special needs. I didn't have a, per se, learning disability to what they would call, uh, which is very interesting. And one thing that attracted me to the master's program at Columbia College in divergent learning, I'm actually a koala myself. <laughs> Uh, it's the whole idea that, uh, I like the fighting qualities because it's a, um, is the fact that uh, it, was, it was me growing up. I was the, non, the student who learned non-traditionally, but was not special needs. Uh, I just didn't learn in the, the road, everybody in a, in a desk, listening to the teacher, regurgitate back, take notes, lecture, which was the teaching style predominantly the time I came through that, school. That's one of the things I, I think um, so many of us who, who taught, taught like we were taught. Instead of, you know, if you were taught lecture style, that's what you thought you were supposed to do as a teacher. Well, and I think we teach the way uh, we were taught, but also the way we learn. And, you know, to this day, I have to stop when I'm teaching my undergraduate classes or the adults I work with, that, you know, just because I'm a very concrete person, and I am, I'll give you a handout that has all the dates and when everything's due and what I'm <laughs> expected to look like and what you need to do to be successful. But then there are some people who are way more global than I am, and I need to accommodate them as well. And I think that's something all educators have to remember is, this, are the students that come into your classroom are going to be all, all varieties, all different styles that you have to, to learn to work with and, and help along their path. So why did you choose to go to Newberry? I chose to go to, <laughs> to Newberry. It's actually a funny story, too, because my senior year in high school, I just had enough. And <laughs> college was never an option being, are you going to go or not going to go? Uh, but my biggest dilemma was, can I go on a senior cruise uh, with my high school buddies? Uh, to which my parents were like, no. And I was like, oh, I, I do want to go. And uh, they were like, no, you're not going to go. And then they finally said, well, you can go, but then you'll have to live at home and go to college here. And I was like, ooh. No, 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 no. <laughs> Newberry College is where my sister went. It was the only school I applied to, and it was tortured to apply. I never even tried anywhere else. Um, I really wasn't that forward thinking. I was just, I think, tired of school in general. Uh, ended up going to Newberry because my sister had cheered for their football team all four years, and so we'd gone to all the games. I was familiar with the campus. I was like, Mom, if you get off my back, I'll apply. It's fine. <laughs> I did. Ended up being, I think, um, one of those. Um, pivotal moments where something is looking out for you, whether it be God or, or what you believe, because that's exactly where I needed to be. You know, for those of you not familiar, Newberry College has a lot of similarities to Columbia College. It is a small liberal arts school where you get one-on-one -on -one personal attention, and that's exactly what I got. Uh, I got helped along, and, and really someone there, or actually a couple of professors took me under their wing. I'm like, you can write, you are smart, you can verbalize, we just need to help you along, and they did, and that was uh, the best decision in the world. 
A friend of mine named Ed Dickey, you may know him from the University of South Carolina, he's also in education, he's in math education. He told me once, because I've always said I was an awful math student. My math teachers here at Columbia College just would cringe when they'd see me coming. And I, would, I told him that, I said, I was a terrible student. He said, Linda, there are no bad students, they're bad teachers. What do you say to that? Um, well, sadly, I, I'd have to agree. Um, I think uh, there, there are. I will say that there can be um, troubling students. Uh, I was one of those as well. Nobody uh, here. Right. But uh, I do believe that there, there are teachers, and just like in any profession, who make poor choices, who, don't, who aren't as professional as they need to be, who don't hone in on their craft as they should. Um, you know, sadly, there are physicians who do that, and bankers, and we can go down the list. Uh, the ones we generally hear about are the ones that make the poor, poor choices, right. um, sadly enough. And those come out in the media, and we don't uh, really extol virtues on the, or a lot of uh, accolades on the ones who uh, do really, really well every day, day in and day out. You don't hear about them. You don't. And, and you know, in elementary school, I was, uh, I had some of those teachers who I think were passing time, and uh, really, some of them did the best they could with what they could. Some of them did, didn't do as much. And you know, I really do believe that's where part of my deficit in math came from because it matriculated on through middle school and high school and I had an algebra one teacher who, you know, all, all he did is if you answered the right question, he'd throw you some candy. You know, I sat in the corner and got no candy. So that's the only thing I remember about algebra one is throwing candy. And I was like, I don't get any candy. And, um, but I had to go to a tutor. It was horrible. And so um, things of that nature, which, you know, I still hold with me today. And I still have uh, math phobia, math anxiety is, I think, uh, and there's been actual research on that. Um, and, you know, I would tell you I, I would have that. Uh, I barely scraped through the, the GRE in the math portion, and that was with a lot of prayer and a lot of patience uh, from friends who helped me, you know, is column A bigger than column B, or is column C equal? And I was like, I have no idea, no idea. <laughs> whatever. So, so we have two math, math, we have two math phobics right, right here. So we'll, we'll move away from math before we both get nervous. But I will tell you, though, on the antithesis I've learned why I, teach, I was um, a social studies teacher by trade is, to me, history, I can paint a picture in my brain. And so it's very easy for me to remember. Uh, not necessarily specific dates, but I can go through and tell you about uh, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, or I can, I can paint that vividly. I taught American government, and as dysfunctional as government can tend to be, I can walk you through how a bill becomes a law and then sing you the little song from Schoolhouse Rock, and we can all do those sorts of things. Uh, and that, that is, is very, very vivid to me. Um, where other people, I understand, probably may have had social studies teachers that were snoozeville and they were just horrible, and all they did was lecture and you know, pulled out those rickety old yellow notes and just, nah, 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 like from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You know? <laughs> uh, and nobody likes that, that either. Uh, but I think it's all about where you find your passion, and I just did not have some teachers who had the passion for the subjects that they were teaching. But you ended up where you needed to be. I ended up where I needed to be because I think eventually with enough support from those around you, with love and determination, everybody can end up where they need to be. And that's where everybody has a different path. Now, I've, I've noticed that you like to run. Were you active in any sports when you were at Newberry? Or is running just something that you kind of fell into? Uh, I ran track when I was in high school. At that particular time, Newberry did not offer uh, many of the diverse sports they offer now. And so uh, I did not. Uh, but I do love to run. It's one of those things that helps me process the day. Miss um, Franklin was asking me, she was like, you know, when was the last time you ran? I was like, well, after our division meeting we had today, I uh, ran home, let the dog out, ran. And she was like, how far did you run? I was like, four miles. And then took a quick shower and came back. And lo and behold, though, I go in our kitchen and had a big old sloppy piece of cake. But that's, you know, the way it, uh, it, it, it works goes. out. It, 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 it doesn't help to have public cake in there. <laughs> Kitchen. Okay, what else do you do besides running? What else do you do for fun? Well, that's the whole thing. Uh, when uh, Dr. Fields asked me to do this, I was like, you know, she was like, we're going to talk about what you like to do for fun. I was like, well, I'm not that exciting. <laughs> um, I work a lot. Uh, I, my biggest es escape is going to the movies. I love the movies, whether it's at home or on TV, because it's the one part of the day that or one time that I don't think about anything else. I can literally follow what's going on screen, follow the characters, and for two hours be so absorbed. Most any other time when I run, if I read a book, before I go to bed, I think about the day, I think about what needs to be done, I send emails to myself, I'm very, very type A. 
uh, that way, uh, very organized. Um, and so that's the, the one escape that I really, really love. I could do that in a really, really good book, but I read so much professionally and with the research courses I teach, I'm always reading research that students are producing that uh, sometimes I just don't like to read. Um, and so movies are, are something that uh, I really, really uh, use as my escape mechanism. What type of movie do you like most? Is there a genre? Uh, anything but, but scary, because I have a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I know, and it's sad. I'm 41 years old and wake up in the middle of the night and scare my poor dog to death. Um, and that's just from a preview. That whole mama movie with the kids. Mama! And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> I'm just, that's 10 seconds, just 10 seconds. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, it's just crazy. But uh, anything. Um, but that I really love um, a, a good story, and so it can be anything from like the Abraham Lincoln that Steven Spielberg did was great, but it was really good because have you seen Argo? Uh, I have not yet. Uh, that's I've heard on my list. Uh, but it can also be something really, really funny. Um, the other night, just because I needed uh, something funny, I watched um, the movie about all the, the monsters of the cartoon go to live Hotel Transylvania. Okay. You know, it just because it, 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 there wasn't a whole lot to it, but it, my palate varies. It, it doesn't make uh, any difference. I just uh, want to be entertained. All right. Um, what choices did you make that were the most important for your career? I would think that and that's a really hard question to answer because sometimes I've made choices that have really helped me long term that I didn't realize I was even making at the time. Uh, sometimes I think we make choices that intuitively benefit us at the moment because I thought we make them, but even long term they meant more than we thought. Uh, for example, going into the divergent learning program, I wanted a master's degree um, because I wanted to further my education. Also in the South Carolina education system, if you have a master's degree, you make more money. And so I wanted that boosted in pay. Um, I wanted to reach my students more, but in that program I really learned about myself. And not to sound all cliche, but I was a divergent learner and had no earthly idea that that was me. So it opened up a lot of struggles I had that I just thought, you know, I'm just dumb, you know, until I got to a certain point uh, where all of a sudden this knowledge came upon me. Um, I think choosing education in my path at Newberry, I waffled a little bit, um, seeing how difficult it was for my mother to be a teacher and the time commitments. I thought about communications, went that route for a little bit, came back to teaching, got all the way to student teaching and was going to go into uh, higher education uh, student services, dean of students route, and had already been accepted to USC and started my student teaching and loved it, had the best time and decided, well, I'll do this for just a year or two and then go back to school, well, you know, 11 years later. Uh, it was uh, something, so I think those kind of choices uh, were made on the spur of the moment for what I, I thought I, I found to do, but it turned out to be a, a lifetime career opportunity. Did you start out at Dutch Fork, or where, where did you? I did. I student taught in Newberry County at Mid-Carolina High School, which is a very small rural school, uh, but was probably one of the best teaching experiences I had, just because this was back in... Um, the early, early 1990s. Uh, and uh, it was one of those experiences where I had a mother come in and I was with a cooperating teacher, but I was essentially in charge. And she was just like, you know, Mr. Burkett, you just, you just be him senseless if you need to because he just needs to know how to do things. And I was like, and the cooperating teacher was like, no, you can't do that. And so, but it was that, it was very rural, very family oriented. The school had about 300 students. All the teachers and the students knew everybody. And it was truly a family environment that, in a school that uh, had physical problems, it was dilapidated, it was, it was uh, uh, not as in pristine shape as, as the new one is, they've since built a, another one. But it was just a good experience. I went from there to big care, um, to, uh, what was it called then? Irmo Middle School Campus I, yes. where I did some, some middle school teaching, uh, which was a whole different atmosphere. Yes. You're going into suburbia, and uh, that was a whole different experience, which, I enjoyed, which again, speaking of career choices, I really had fought to stay in Mid Carolina. We did six weeks in one and six weeks in the other, and really didn't want to go. But because of my work at Campus I, I got the job at uh, Dutch Fork High School because you never know who knows somebody. And my cooperating teacher knew the director of personnel, and knew the, and so it all kind of worked out. But I landed at Dutch Fork. It was the second year it was open, um, brand new school, and uh, just uh, loved every minute of being there. 
and watched it grow into, when I started, there were 500 some students. When I left, there were 2,000 and 200. Why did you All because of me. <laughs> Why did you move out of public education into um, a private school, higher ed? I was actually uh, just um, kind of moseying along in my Dutch Fork career, uh, thinking, you know, is there something else I want to do? The most uh, logical leap is administration. Did I want to be an assistant principal? That I, I reconciled with and actually interviewed for a position. Um, and at the time, very devastated I didn't get it. Uh, but then realized that was one of those things where it, it really wasn't right for me. Uh, people who do high school administration, for instance, or public school administration at all, deal with a lot of the negatives mm -hmm. and not as much of the positives. And that's something that um, I don't do, do well with, especially at that particular time. And then an opportunity came that Newberry College was looking for uh, somebody to do their social studies methods course in secondary ed. The chair at that time, Sharon Feaster, contacted me and she said, aren't you working on your doctorate? And I said, I am. And she goes, well, you know, would you come up and talk to us? Because the outgoing chair was there when I was there and spoke very highly of me. And so um, I went up and interviewed and things seemed to, to work out and uh, got to Newberry College. And it was a great experience because in their teacher ed program, you got to see all, it's such a small school, all the different facets and work in all the different uh, areas of assessment and curriculum design and, and all of those pieces student teaching and observations uh, and probably would still be there if it weren't for the drive because uh, as much as I love Newberry I didn't want to live in Newberry I want to live in Columbia where I live I know and so uh, I was commuting back and forth about a little over an hour each way and so um, that got to be very very cumbersome uh, as far as taking time out of your day when you want to go to an event at night so therefore you got to stay and so forth uh, and so when the job opened up at Columbia College and I interviewed, it was um, uh, also a, a very big blessing because my mother's, uh, my father had passed away, my mother's uh, health had become um, a little in turmoil and I wanted to be closer there because right. you added an hour to get to here then an hour to get to Florence um, or a little more. You guys speak with And so uh, I wanted to be a little, a little right. closer. So, oops, cell phone. Um, do you have a bucket list? Um, there are a few things uh, I would like to do. I, I try to um, take them in, in chunks. Uh, there are, you know, I don't want to climb Mount Everest or any of those <laughs> sorts of things, but I try to, when opportunities come around, I try to think, is that something I want to spend my resources to do? Is it something that's going to be meaningful to me? That's kind of how I, I, I look at it. Um, yeah, there's some things that, um, at some point in my life, I, I want to do, um, some of them are, are kind of interesting because one of the questions that Dr. Fields sent out, you know, just sort of you get a look at, is is there another career you might do if it's not this one? And one of the things I've always wanted to do is work at Disney World. And so <laughs> at some point in my life, I think I'm going to work at Disney World. It may be managing Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, but I'm going to do it just because it's the happiest place on earth and I just love it. And so I've applied before. I got into higher ed, actually applied, but they promote so much from within, you literally have to start at Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and work your way up to, to something that, that pays you kind of salary. Well, I've worn those head costumes before. You don't want to do that, trust me. <laughs> I don't know that I want to be winning the food, but <laughs> no, you uh, I think I do uh, want to do something like that. So that would be something on a, a bucket list. Uh, also, crazy things like, and some of you may have already had this experience. I think I'm going to wait tables one time just to see what it's like. I know people are like, it's horrible. You don't want to do that. Ah. But I think, you know, I've worked in customer service my entire life through high school and college. And I even worked at a Chick-fil-A behind the counter. But, you know, the whole idea of it's not really my right to complain if I haven't done it myself and think, because, you know, my mind, I'm like, I could serve you this better. I could bring you the mustard and you drink all the same time. Why don't you have to make 15 drinks? <laughs> but until I can actually do yeah. it, it, it's something that I think of. At some point in my life, I, I'd like to do so. I have weird things I want, I want to, to do. You have a list. I do. No. Uh, you were a student here. You got your master's degree here. What was different coming back as a professor uh, as opposed to being a student? Oh, it was vastly different just in the fact that the graduate school is mainly on the weekends, and so I didn't interact a great deal with the, the undergrad student population. And coming back to work full time, uh, you do. You, know, you see them, even though when I first came back, I really worked just in the graduate school. You run into them in the hallways, you run into 
all of the women uh, taking uh, the women's college classes, and it's a whole different dynamic. Uh, and it was my first foray into single gender education because it had just really hit the middle schools when I came out of public education, uh, which is now um, in the foray into some middle schools and even into some high schools. And so it was very interesting to see, um, honestly, you know, somebody coming to school to class in slippers. I've never seen that before. And so, um, but you know, I think when it's a single gender, people do different things. And so, um, it, it was uh, very interesting. And in, have you gotten comfortable being in a single gender education um, area? Do you uh, feel? It doesn't bother me at all, um, except for back in the day, when I taught a couple of years of LA 100, and there are certain topics we're just not going to talk about. <laughs> and so, you know, um, there are just certain things I'm, I don't have experience with, and so we just I can refer you to others. But it's very, very similar to what it was like in my public school classroom. You know, if a child came to me and said they were having problems, female problems, then we would just <laughs> on to the nurse. You go see the nurse. So, uh, we do the, the same thing. Um, I'm not shy about I mean, having a mother and an older sister, I'm, but you know, there are just certain things I can't assist you with. So I have a referral card right on my desk now that I can just call up and we'll. Dr. Bud is there for me. So is, there, just, is there any advice that you wish you had listened to? Um, I would say uh, trust your instincts, because your instincts are generally right, your gut. Um, I think especially early in life, if, if the old Chris could go back and talk to a young Chris, it would be don't really put as much stock in what other people think of you. It's really more important with those who love and respect you think. And, I think as adolescents, even as adults, sometimes we put a lot of, of emphasis on what other people have to say and think, even those people who really don't have our best interests at heart, that um, I really wish I did not put as much stuff in that. You mentioned very briefly um, liberal arts education. In this, this era now of so much specialization, what, what's the advantage that you see in the liberal arts education? Uh, I think the biggest advantage of a liberal arts education is you learn to speak well, you learn to write well, and you learn to just be well. I think it's an emphasis you get that in many specialized programs you learn a lot of technical skills that you can hone in to do your craft, but you sometimes miss some of those other pieces. Uh, I took art education, I took theater education, or appreciation rather. Uh, and so I think that even though at the time I was like, why am I looking at these slides and these flying buttresses of these cathedrals that I'm never going to see, which I did a point of seeing. So, uh, but I think it all helps make, helps make you educated and well-rounded. And I think that's what a liberal arts education can do that many other specialized degrees sometimes miss. Okay, we're going to go into our real quick um, questions. What's your favorite word? What's your least favorite word? Arrogance. What turns you on? Kindness. What turns you on? I would have to say not only really repetitive, but uh, arrogance. Arrogance again. I, I don't like. Uh, I'm. I like self-assuredness, but I do not like it to the point of you're better than everybody else. That, that's a very good term. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, I love laughing. Laughter, I think, is is one of uh, the most therapeutic sounds you can hear. It's at the appropriate times, uh, it, especially when you get to be part of that laughter. I, I just love with family or with friends or watching a comedy and everybody's on the same page and it's just a funny story. A funny just letting your hair down and letting, let's go. Okay, is there a sound or a noise that you really hate? Uh, I really dislike crying. Um, I know crying can be therapeutic, and I appreciate that, but generally, the times I'm around crying, somebody's very upset, somebody has been hurt or wronged, uh, and that's very distressing to me. So that's a, a sound that I don't like. And we talked a little bit about the profession other than your own that you might like to attempt. So you're going to go be goofy at the... Uh, not, not so much goofy, but I may welcome you. Well, I want to do the Moe's approach. It's a Disney World. Welcome to Disney World! Thank you. <laughs> or CeCe's Pizza. Yeah, no, yeah, not CeCe's Pizza. What's your favorite? <laughs> what? My favorite? 
I do not know when I can do. We don't even go there. Sure. What profession would you most like not to do if you? I would uh, anything in the in the, the healthcare profession. Um, I am not a, a, a germaphobe, but uh, anything. I think I have been trained enough on wearing my rubber gloves for the OSHA requirements that uh, other people's fluids are something I just would rather not be around. Um, my nephew and niece, I have a twin nephew and niece, and so when they were coming along, um, I could tolerate that. But you know, when, when your blood is one thing, but when it's somebody else's, I'm just like, I'm not equipped for that. So, same reason I preschool and elementary school, you know, I don't want watch you eat sand or paste, and then, you know, I don't want you to throw up, because I'm just kidding. So you, um, you have the, the twin niece and nephew. Right. They're 10th uh, grade, you said? 10th grade. Are you giving them any advice about college? Are you talking with them? Are you uh, um, I'm just advising? Trying to, I'm, my sister, who I adore, uh, it just, they all just run ragged. It's just funny to sit back and watch. She is the, she helps my husband. I think I may mention this, and I apologize for not being repetitive. My brother-in-law and sister own a Chick-fil-A, and so she helps in the store. But they also um, are big advocates for the children. And my sister is um, a somewhat stay-at-home mother, and I have very big appreciation for that because she does everything but stay at home. And she runs all around with these children, and they do basketball and gymnastics and uh, everything under the sun to the point where it's just exhausting for me. And I'm just talking to her on the telephone. I'm like, you know, well, when when you, oh, I gotta go make the, and then we're gonna do homework, and then, oh my gosh, we have to, I'm just like, well, okay, bye bye, and call me in two weeks, love you, whatever. Um, and so I, I'm trying to help them, I want them to enjoy the, the experiences that they're having. Um, they're beginning to get a little angst about uh, school. Um, but the neatest thing to watch, though, is one of the twins is naturally gifted, the other one is not. And so it's kind of a, a paradigm of, um, my sister and myself reverse genders and so making sure that you know one isn't too too cocky and the other is doesn't feel too left behind and so um you know i'm the dumb who can come in and spoil too, so that's, <laughs> that's the most fun uh if heaven exists what would you like to hear god say when you arrive at the pearly gates uh, uh i do believe heaven does exist and I hope the uh, two things will be said. Number one is um, your parents and loved ones are, are right there, they're waiting. Uh, because that's something that helps get me through the, the difficult times of having both parents pass in two very difficult manners. Uh, and then the other is I really want to hear something to the effect of, of well done. Um, I think we're all given much um, on this earth and I hope I done just a little bit with what I've been given because you know I think there's always that that doubt of have I done enough do I do enough and, and I just hope to hear that you know along the way uh, I've made a difference had an impact great okay it's going to be your turn now um, if any of you have some questions and I'll ask you to speak up so that the microphone can pick you up and also so that I can hear you so anybody have a question, if you'll just stand, give your name, and then ask a question for Chris. Then he answer everything. <laughs> Questions? Do you have one? I guess not. <laughs> Three or four questions. Quick, quick, quick. Yes. Come, Michelle, Lana, are you going to come to our solo games? If you bring a schedule, I will come to at least one. Okay. But you have to bring it by my office. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Ariel Peel right across the way. All right. Okay, I got you. Then I got you. I'll be there. <laughs> Uh, my name is Caitlin Dixon, and I know you said earlier that you kind of felt left behind because of the there's nothing in place to kind of help you in your team. So, what do you think of the No Child Left Behind Act? That's a really, really good question, and I think uh, the No Child Left Behind Act has some really, really positive points to it. One of them being that teachers need to be highly qualified. In the past, I don't know if you realize this, but even under my social studies certification, I could have been taken out to teach a French class. As long as it was a percentage that I taught within my degree, 
the other percentage didn't really matter. And it was happening all over the place, especially in areas where it was hard to staff qualified teachers. No Child Left Behind has helped make that um, almost uh, uh, non-existent problem these days uh, because everybody has to be highly qualified in their discipline, which I think is, is very, very important. There are other aspects that I wholeheartedly disagree with. I think some of the rating systems and how it penalizes schools for uh, certain test scores and how it, it elevates other schools, I think there are some really, really uh, pieces of that legislation that are more harmful than good. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think it did some really, really positive, had some positive aspects for education, but also some very, very detrimental, which is, sounds like a Pollyanna politician's answer. but. Um, you know, I think uh, overall they've restructured some of it, which I think has been, been on the positive side. They are listening, uh, but probably not nearly enough. While we're kind of on that um, topic, talk a little bit about standardized tests um, and the way that sometimes they are, I believe, misused. I think standardized testing uh, is important on the, on the measure scale because everybody needs to to be measured, meaning all teachers, you know, are you being effective with what you're doing? I think math testing kind of helps that to get some benchmarking. I think what's then done with those results is sometimes where we get into trouble because instead of using it truly for growth, it becomes where well, you're not doing your job or I haven't seen enough growth. And we're not really looking at individual teachers and students. Uh, and I'm not saying again that there are teachers out there who don't need to be pushed a little bit out of their comfort zone, but uh, I think sometimes we did what is called high stakes testing which you know brings anxiety to the teachers to the students to the school everybody is just engrossed in this preparing for the test and so therefore we don't really do any teaching and learning which i think is 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 a bad call uh, altogether uh, i think the state of education right now is in transition i think there is no magic uh, answer if there were i would be really really rich and be on oprah and it would all just be a great time the one thing I, I think we don't do well is a dialogue about what works. I think somebody comes up with a, their proposed solution and we move in that direction and everybody just adapts. Especially the bigger school districts, uh, we tend to do a lot of what Texas does, what California does. And that necessarily, parts of it may work, but it may not work for South Carolina. South Carolina is very indicative of our own population with our own struggles and I think sometimes we need to pay very close attention to our students and what we need or haven't had or what we have had and what we don't need as much of. And I think we don't, we don't do that well. We don't listen to our own students and I think we don't listen to our own parents uh, as much as we should. Another question? Yes. Uh, Dr. Mayor Crawford, and do you feel that because you struggled so much in school it made you a better teacher? I think that it made me a little more understanding that sometimes I need to be reminded of that understanding because I think we all build in high expectations uh, as educators and even as professors uh, that sometimes uh, we have to remember everybody brings with them their own baggage, if you will. And I think it's important to help understand but not necessarily excuse uh, because that's one thing that I was pushed that it wasn't an excuse but it was a, a more of how can we help you get around that. I had a professor at Newberry who was, you know, like, I can't write, oh, I'll never read, oh. And he was like, well, first of all, you got to stop, and you can. It's just going to take you three or four drafts. Let's go. And, and that sort of understanding and mentoring that I think um, I like to, to, to use in my own. And I think um, all of our experiences shape us to be who we're going to be, whether that be in a positive light or not so positive light. And it's our job to help kind of turn it around and into something that I hope I, I always remember my struggle when I look at, at the students. Thank you.